All right, welcome everybody. Uh, I expected a bigger turnout for this event, which I announced in various places. I talk English for the benefit of our guest, Professor Ugo Baldi. And uh, before I give the floor to him, I will say a few words as to why uh, this event happened. Um, because I actually teach at this institution computational linguistics, so this is uh, not something that you would connect easily with uh, depleting resources. So um, I have to go a little bit back. When I was at school, at some point I got interested in all the books that were, and, you know, were sitting on our shelves. And among them were a couple of those that made history. Uh, one is this book with the title Limits to Growth, which I read. And the other was the um, uh, book with a similar title to one that Hugo is about to uh, be publishing in English. Uh, it appeared in Italian, and it's called uh, Der Geplünderte Planet by Herbert Gould. And uh, it made a big impression on me. Because, you know, you see uh, civilization in a slightly different way. But when, when it came to these projections, you know, limits to growth, you look at it, you know, I mean, this, we're talking in the middle of the 70s, or late 70s. I was a kid, you know, 21st century. This is way in the future. So you see the projections, you know, they're looking dire, but they were so far away. And um, of course, there was big movements, you know, ecological movement, anti-nuclear, and so on. And I looked at it and said, you know, but still, it's sort of running the, the same way as it used to. I mean, uh, civilization is sort of following its course. And then somebody, a uh, similar of mine, gave me an article to read on peak oil some years ago. I look at it and I say, well, probably we're here. So if this is true, then we have actually reached this inflection point where things start to, you know, turn out to be different. Um, because in that book they said that, you know, for 40 years we'll have a smooth ride and then things will turn to be difficult. So I did what I, you know, knew to do best is, you know, do numbers. So, you know, I, I studied mathematics, so I did the calculations, and the more I did it, the more it seemed correct. And then um, I turned to various sites. So at that time, you know, going to a bookshop wasn't really a big help. So the, the future looked really rosy when you asked the authors. When you go into the blogosphere, things were a little different. So there are a few websites which I read. Um, part of which uh, are in English. So there's this energy beta, which is now called resilience.org. And then there's the oil drum, lots of retired oil uh, engineers. And uh, there are some in German, which I can re recommend to you if you haven't heard of them. Uh, there's, for example, a group that is interested in facing the challenge head on. Um, they gave me some flyers. I, I'm actually uh, participating there. It's called Transition Town Bielefeld, run by Gerd Wessling. And of course, all the others, because it's a non profit uh, movement, grassroots, if you want, um, trying to face the challenge of peak oil. What does it mean that there is no more oil to be pumped than we're already pumping? So there are individual challenges, uh, not only for society. And so, you know, it's, it's something that people do. They get together and ask themselves, what's the problem? How do we go about it? So it's completely non-profit. You can go join them. Hey, you, you can uh, take a flyer or two if you want and publicize it. And uh, it's a movement that has sort of 
organizations, groups in many cities all around the globe. And then there's a society called Association for the Study of Peak Oil, so peak oil and gas by now, um, which is specifically devoted to analyzing that question, right? And uh, I've been going to the meetings for one or two years. Very interesting. And uh, actually, it turned out that Ugo Bardi, and you're not, no longer head of um, the Italian chapter, but. Okay. So, he, former president of, you know, ASPO Italia. And um, I was fortunate enough to, you know, be introduced to his blog early on. It's called Effetto Cassandra, but uh, for our benefit, he uh, translates most of the articles into English. Since uh, you can read the English blog, um, Cassandra's Legacy. And uh, what I like most about it, apart from the, the, you know, the huge energy that went into it, um, is that it's a mix of, you know, hard science and, you know, questions that go far beyond. So how, how should we go about, you know, like, in philosophy, my favorite is, you know, uh, peak oil, decline, and uh, stoic philosophy. How do they connect? So he has a story to tell about this. And so I asked myself, what's my place in that, um, well, in that um, development? And being an academic, an intellectual, I said, you know, the best thing I could do is think about it and uh, write about it. So I do occasionally write about things that I find. It's easy to find what I write. You just follow from my web page to this little link called Big Oil. And I've been thinking to, to make this public. So the, the, big, the big problem now is that there isn't so far a real uh, you know, big debate about what we ought to be doing. Because uh, you know, we are facing serious problems. So we need to think about it, and we need to hear people who have actually something to say. Yes, and so I thought that at the university, I'll you know, uh, invite people or have a discussion about future challenges. And so this, uh, this made me invite uh, Ugo Bardi for this tonight because he's one of these people I admire most for all the dedication. He's a physical chemist, so uh, ex-crystallographer. Uh, then he turned into um, system sciences. Yeah, that's the basis of the modeling in limits to growth. And he's been doing lots of things, uh, you know, surrounding sustainability, life cycle analysis, uh, oil, mineral resources. And uh, I want to show you this copy. He's actually written this book called The Limits to Growth Revisited. So it's looking again, you know, 40 years after how it played out and uh, what should we learn from it. So this is the reason why I invited him to come here to talk to you and to us all. And I'm very happy that he uh, followed my invitation. He will, he will talk for about... Um, 45, 50 minutes, so that will give us plenty of time for discussion if you want to. The lecture is being filmed. So if you disagree with, you know, being on the uh, uh, film, you just tell me, we can cut right after his talk and then... Why well, it's important, because, you know, if I put this up, uh, you know, for everybody to see, maybe you don't want to be seen or heard. Just let me know. Okay, so I give the floor to 
Hugo Biden. All right, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for this introduction, which uh, I hope will uh, will have clarified a little bit what I'm trying to tell you, and I will um, try to keep you maybe for 45 minutes, according to my watch, and uh, we see what we can do here. And uh, as uh, Marcus told you, I would like to start with something that you may have heard about, especially those of you who look a little bit older than, uh, than the average student. And uh, this is the story of the limits to growth in 1972, which needs to be put a little bit in context. What do we mean as limits to growth? And it has been very interesting today to discuss with Marcus in, uh, in, the, in the field of linguistics uh, it is the basic problem. I tell you limits to growth and you understand something. I transmit you a concept in the form of a few words, limits to growth, and you have in mind something which refers to this limits to growth. But what does it mean? I mean, the big problem with this story back in 1972 was how to transmit the concept of limits to everybody. Because this is a global problem. If we have to solve a global problem, we need to understand everybody what the global problem is. Otherwise, we're just discussing philosophy. And that's not good enough. Because it is a big systemic problem that all of you have, just like I have. So the problem is to explain what limits to growth is. And, and it's very interesting because the question of limits I don't know if you, you what, what you feel if you study, study economics or geology or, or what, or physics, whatever you're studying. But the concept that there are limits has been known uh, from mid 19th century, a couple of centuries less than that. So this work, 1972, is the first attempt to quantify, to try to go understand. We know that physically this planet is limited, is a, is a ball, is a sphere in the middle of space. But what is going to happen? Let's try to, how would limits show up? What kind of trajectory our economic system would experience as a result of the fact that the, the resources we use are limited? And this was extremely advanced for 1972. And they come up with, a, with an answer, which maybe you remember having seen you are very, you, you ladies, they are very young, and you probably never, did you ever see this? You, you, you never, you never suspected that such a thing existed. That was, of course, it was 40 years ago, you were, um, don't know where, but some, not, not here, anyway. So what you see here, is something very interesting, because you have a projection which was made in the early 70s, so somewhere about here, and projected to the 21st century. And you see there is a point here about, about now where you see an inversion, a change, a big modification of, of the curves. So far we are used to think in terms of growth, economic growth, economic growth is good. We want economic growth, we want to restart economic growth, we want to have more economic growth, we want everybody to grow, we want you to grow uh, so much that, that you don't stop until you, have, uh, you are six meters tall, and, and then you keep going. So, now you see that there is a limit. This is the point where the limits to grow start kicking in. There is something that happens there, and has to do with the fact that resources go down, population keeps going up, that's go down and then bang. It's a little worrisome, right? It's grow up with that. Don't, don't, don't worry, it's just, just a model. Don't, don't, you, you, you're up there, you're very close to the exit. You can run away if you like. Don't, don't worry, just models, just models. Problem is, the problem is this thing was not understood. There was a problem of communication. Because people were saying, like, this is nice, but why? You're asking yourself the same question, right? Why do, should we have this kind of behavior? And uh, the answer was something like this, which I'm afraid was not easy to understand. This is the actual model. And uh, I mean, I'm not, going, I'm not here to criticize the people who did this study, very nice people. I, I knew, I met them 40 years, 
later and, uh, and uh, they did the best that they could. It was a very advanced study, it was very good, very well made. It stood the test of time. Problem was communicating this because it was very new. They didn't really themselves, they were, they, they were treading in an unknown ground and they didn't know exactly why. But they did an excellent work. Actually, it turns out that this is a very good model. But they did it and they had very big problems in understanding, explaining in such a way that people would understand. So that book sold more than one million copies. Most people didn't go farther than the first chapter and they misunderstood even just the first chapter. Very few people arrived to the end and and you probably know that it was criticized, it, um, lambasted in all possible ways, and, and, and eventually most people decided it was a scam, it was wrong, it was, it was not wrong, because so far we have been following these curves very, very closely. Again, don't worry, it's just a model. But the problem, I think, is now to try to convey, we still have time to avoid that little, that thing, that uh, the slightly worrisome thing that you see here, that's going up. Gee, this should happen in about 2050. So we still have some time. But we need to explain and to have it understood. We need to put the model back on its head, like this, we have, to go back to the basics of the system and try to explain how it goes, how it works, why exactly the limits to growth is bringing us to collapse, to economic collapse, which I think, I don't know what, how you feel right now. I'm coming from Italy, and this feeling that collapse is uh, very close to me. Maybe in Germany you still a little bit, you feel that you're far away from collapse, but if maybe some one of you is, comes from Greece, in that case you, 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 you already know what collapse is. So I, I focus now on uh, mining and mineral resources, which are by definition the limited resources. So our economy is based on mineral resources. And I try to explain to you a little bit what we, we mean as this. And, and our society is based on mining. We don't usually stop to think about that, but mines go back to 10,000 years years before our, the start of our year, or before, before Christ. So these are mines in Sussex, England. And you know what we were mining here? Mining this. I took it. I borrowed it from Marcus. You know what is this? Any geologist in the audience? Raise your hand, geologists. No, no geologists. You are a geologist. You know what is this? Flintstone, exactly, Flintstone. So, Flintstone has to be mined. You have to dig to find the, fin the stone, and then you use it. You know, you, know, you know what it was used for. You've seen the, in TV the Flintstones. <laughs> yes, I, I keep it. It's a very good, it's very useful also, also for defending myself in, ca in case I say something that you don't like, know that I am armed. <laughs> so, for 12,000 years, we have been mining things. And let me, let me go through a little bit of... Uh, history and, and, and letting you understanding how this thing goes. Because you see, there has been, where, the, where does this come from, the question is. And uh, the point is there has been a, a revolution in geology, which I think is comparable, you are a geologist, you know, comparable to the revolution in uh, physics. People have been very excited about the Higgs boson, which is fine, it's a big discovery, it's fine for me, but but in the same stretch of time, there have been a big revolution in Earth sciences, how the Earth system works. And it is very relevant, much more relevant than the Higgs boson about on our life, because we don't mine anymore Flintstones. Uh, now, the youngest of you, you may, you may want to learn about this. You may be turned out useful if, if those curves keep going the way, but <coughs> just, just models. So why do we have these stones, this peculiar stone? Um, that has to do with the structure of the planet, which you probably saw this, you already studied this in high school. The fact that the Earth, if you look down, look at your feet, 
keep looking, go down, 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 uh, 6,000 kilometers, you find this very hot nucleus, which is about 6,000 degrees centigrade. And this has been known for about now less than 100 years, and it's, it's fundamental. You have this hot nucleus, which makes the Earth system work. Otherwise, there, would, there could not be any life on Earth, unless you have an active nucleus. This is a relatively recent discovery, which has not been publicized, because Earth scientists are not so good as physicists in public relations. But the reason why you have this huge ball of fire right below, and I think it's, it's relevant now to, you know, this was discovered first by Alfred Wegener in 1912. You have heard of that. It's 100 years from the discovery of what is called the continental derived movement of continents. Uh, Wegener was a great man, by all means. He was, it's, he was one of those genius scientists, uh, these intuitions, and he revolutioned, revolutionized the field of geology. It took time for people to understand the relevance of the fact that continents move. Why should they move? I mean, first, first people were, were puzzled. Well, there's, yes, there's these things, you know, that you see how fossils are distributed, and you, you conclude that the continents were all together at some point, but it was like, like, like a funny things. And then, then instead, we are discovering now that it's fundamental. The movement of the continents is part of a series of cycles that make the whole ecosystem work. Did you know that? Did you know that? Had you studied that? You know this? You, know the, you probably know the story of the Ring of Fire. You know, the earthquakes, tsunamis, and the big waves came over Japan, and you see it in TV, and everybody is very, very, very amusing, unless you are there, of course. But these volcanoes are the result of the movement of the plates or the, the surface of the Earth. And this is fundamental for so many, not, not just for killing people by earthquakes, but for volcanoes' uh, activity that keeps the Earth moving, keeps the system moving. So you have this big movement of uh, the bottom of the ocean, the lithosphere goes, is continuously pushed under the continent. The continent rides over the ocean, goes up and pushes this down, and that creates a lot of friction, a tremendous amount of energy, which creates volcanoes. And those volcanoes, without volcanoes, you could not have an atmosphere on this planet. The system could not work. You need this cycle to make the system work. And this is a relatively recent discovery. I know you like chemistry, right? Um, how many chemists in the audience? Raise your hand. Chemist, anyone? What, what are you doing here? What, what? <laughs> Any one of you is a student? <laughs> what you guys are studying? Ladies are studying economics, physics, geology, something. Then never, never mind, you'll discover this later on. Okay. In, in time, you'll discover what is your field. It's, it's, it's a vocation, as you know. So I, I like to, to show this, uh, this picture. At uh, this point, if you really, you can, you can run away if you like. Because uh, that you, you can say, oh, I, I forgot uh, the, to turn off the, the, the light or the, or the stove, and, and so you, you are excused if you like. But just a little note from a chemist, you know, you know what is this, right? Carbon dioxide. This is necessary for plants. Just like reactive mo um, gases in the atmosphere. Now, if it is this reactive, it reacts. It reacts with silicates. And it disappears. So, in time, the reaction consumes carbon dioxide. Am I right? and uh, the Earth dies. How long do you think it could last? This It's, it's a simplification. It's, not, it's more complex than this, but in about 100,000 years, this reaction destroys all the CO2 from the atmosphere. Plants die because without CO2 you cannot have photosynthesis. Without photosynthesis, no life. But you're still alive, and uh, the life on Earth has been around for millions of years. So. There's got to be some way to bring back CO2 in the atmosphere, and that's volcanoes. 
And the beauty of this thing is that this reaction depends on temperature. High temperature accelerated, but since CO2 is also a greenhouse gas, the reaction regulates itself. The, the air gets hotter, the reaction, because there's too much CO2, CO2 is a greenhouse gas, the, the earth gets hotter. This reaction goes faster, and so it consumes more CO2. And so you cool down the earth. This is the main mechanism of temperature control of the planet. It's an example of cycle, one of the many cycles that keeps the planet the way it is. This is called homeostasis. You could use the word equilibrium. It's not really an equilibrium, but, uh, but it's something that stabilizes the system. This is um, not so recent, but I'm sure that you, you geologists, you know about that? You know it? No? Okay, you keep studying geology, right? And it's, it's, it's something that is so fundamental, that's much more fundamental than, than the many things which appear in TV. And, but it's not publicized. Not many people know about how important this thing is. It, and it won't save us from global warming because the time constant of this reaction is about a million years. So the, the CO2 that we are throwing into the atmosphere right now by burning hydrocarbons will be eventually reabsorbed by this reaction in a few million years. And then everything will be fine. If you can, if you can wait, it's, it's fine. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting, this story. I like to tell it, but uh, more for the students in chemistry, so let me keep going. But anyway, the reaction is, is based on volcanoes, and, and it's, it's fantastic. It's a very interesting story that keeps the Earth at some stability. You see the time constant of this thing. It's more or less stable, but goes up and down with a time scale of 50 or 100 million years. So stability is there, but takes a lot of time. Also, also seeing in more recent times, this is there is. But this just to scare you a little bit, because if we keep um, emitting CO2, then, then we alter these cycles, and eventually the Earth will compensate. But uh, this is the, but the point that I want to tell you, that, that these volcanoes, not only are useful to balance the atmospheric composition, but are also fundamental for creating things like this, which we call minerals, and in more general terms, we call ores, which means all those concentrations elements that we are interested in, from gold to flint, silicon, whatever you have, uh, iron, or it's normally, not in all cases, but normally, related to, the, to this volcanic heat. And the fact that we have a civilization, that we have mines, that we have an economy, that we have uh, things that move, it all is based on the fact that we have these earth movements that create life, create concentrations of minerals, which then precipitate and forms those things that we call ores, and we can exploit. Go on the moon, you find no gold. Go on Mars, because there is no, no volcanoes on Mars, so you don't find, well, there were long ago, but so maybe you can still find minerals created at the time when Mars had volcanoes, but everything we have here is the result of hundreds of millions of years of movement of energy created by the Earth's core, which have created things that we can exploit, like, like for instance, the golden nuggets. You see, this world largest golden nuggets from Las Vegas or somewhere. This is very big, but golden nuggets that you know the story of the, of the uh, people, the miners, gold miners, or the in California, for instance, the gold rush. It's very easy to find gold. You see, these people are, and don't, don't, don't have anything special. They have just a pan. And if there is gold here, heavy, and in chunks, which we call nuggets, so it's easy to find. It's a good job for you if you were born, say, three or 4,000 years ago, when there was still gold in the European rivers. Now it is all gone. 
it's no more, but a little bit. Some people still can find money, some, some nuggets. But all the nuggets in Europe have been found, basically, and used and melted and transformed into, into whatever object of gold you have on your body. I don't, I don't see. You ladies have something golden around? No. Maybe you're good, good girls. No gold. No. But you see, it doesn't take that much. It's this kind of panning is called panning. You just exploit the higher density. It was already done 5,000 years before Christ. And because it was, it was the result of hundreds of millions of years of processing. And, and then you, you see it's a fascinating story because then you go find these people, these, these things 5,000 years ago. Can you imagine this guy? how powerful he was in life. He, he was buried with so much gold around him. He must have been a tremendously powerful man, a king. You know, he had this chapter and say, you do what I, what I say, I don't dare, the, 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 disobey me. So he was buried with all this gold, and uh, I'm sure he would not have imagined that, uh, that his skeleton would have been shown 7,000 years afterwards to, to you. Which is strange, but uh, but it's uh, it's uh, I'm showing you just some examples because gold has been with us for so much time. You know this this is the mask, one of the masks that uh, Eric Schliemann found in the in the city that he found. It, he called Troy. The, 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 uh, his, this is called the mask of Agamemnon. Of course, it's it's a literary license because we cannot say that. Some people even say that it's a fake, but I think not. I think. You see, when you start having mines and minerals and gold, you can start with portraits. This is one of the first portraits we have. And I think you can see, we can see the face of this guy who lived uh, about 6,000 years ago, maybe 5,000 years ago, or anyway, long before. So, so mining, mining is permeating the society. We cannot survive without mining. We cannot even think our society without mining. But for instance, you go thinking about it. The, all this gold mining, this gold mask, were made by people who had a relatively easy time finding gold. You could find gold in the rivers of Europe, in Italy, in Spain, in, uh, in um, what is today Iran. It's a plenty of gold, but not now. If you were now to go to the rivers and try to find Gold. There was no gold now. It's all, all being used. And so there is a long story of gold, which I'm not going to tell you, but just, just showing you this flooring in gold. And but things have changed a lot now. Long ago, our society was all based on gold. You needed gold, or mainly you needed gold to pay armies. And that was the purpose of these things that we, ca we call coins. But in times, things have changed. You have these mines. This, this is one of the largest mine, gold mines in history in South America. The mine of Potosi, exploited by the Spanish, silver and gold. So many tons of gold for about 8 million people dead in mining this thing in unhealthy conditions, uh, fatigue and effort and, and poor nutrition. Uh, we wonder why people would do this kind of thing, but it's normal. We have this relation with mining. And um, if gold was so important up to a few hundred years ago, then things have changed now. So let me show you this. Have you seen this? This is not far from here. You recognize this place? You, you, Type Garzweiler on Google Maps, so you find this. This is one of the largest coal mines in the world, and it's not far from here. And you can zoom on this, and you, and you, and you see strange, strange objects. What is this? Have you ever seen this? Did, did you know there was this thing not so far from here? And uh, this is the object that you... Have you seen this before? This is the scale of the mining today. It's not any more people with a pen that go doing that. It's, this is the scale. It's gigantic. It's, it's like this. You see, this, this thing is go, goes moving and 
and uh, cutting the earth, and this is coal, but it's strange because this is brown. The coal, you, you know, it's something dark. You're a geologist, you know, the coal is black, right? And, but you are, we are mining. In order to mine large amounts, or whatever we mine, in this case, coal, then we, we need to process enormous amounts of ground, of, of mat materials. And you have this thing that goes grinding materials and then, then processing this, and it, it works, but it's, it's huge, it's, it's fantastic things, and uh, we keep doing this. You know, this, this is not a coal mine, this is a um, diamond mine somewhere in Russia. We make these enormous holes in the ground, and then there is no more, no, nothing left. In time, this will become a lake. In 100 years, you can go sailing on this lake, but it will never be again a diamond mine. Uh, and like this is a copper mine. Also, this eventually will become a nice lake where you can go sailing and you'll be very happy. And, uh, and you know, this is, we have become very good at doing this kind of things, at destroying enormous areas of this planet, because this is the scale of mining today. And uh, it's becoming a question of money, and uh, we burn these things. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not just the fact that, uh, that we make holes in the ground. Making holes in the ground, you, you have to be careful with uh, these big holes. When, watch your steps, because especially at night, if you go in that town in Russia, this, you've got to know that there is this big hole just outside, and then if, if you're drunk, you could fall inside. But the problem is not so much the hole, but the fact that we're burning this thing, and as I was telling you before, burning is no good for us, because we create climate change. And uh, climate change is a direct effect of burning hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are a mineral resource. We burn hydrocarbons. First problem, there is a finite amount of hydrocarbons to burn, but even worse problem, as long as we need to fill up our cars with hydrocarbons, then we send carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and that's no good. No good at all. It's going to be a big, big problem. You have seen the problem with the Arctic Sea and the fires in Siberia, drought in the United States. I want to show you this figures here, drought in Italy. This is close to my house. You know, this is a fig tree. And uh, you know, the fig died on the plant because of the heat. It's never been seen in human memory. First time, in, as, as far as people can remember, that you would not get figs from fig trees, because things are changing. Now, if you want to eat figs, okay, maybe you can buy one from some, somewhere, from a greenhouse cultivation, but this is very worrisome. And I think, I think it gave me some idea of the urgency of the thing, because really it's, 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 uh, it's uh, scaring, because, you know, it's, uh, you know, everything has been doing, going some way, that, uh, of course, weather changes all the time, but you see the destruction of things which used to be cultivated here, been, have been there for a long time, and now things are really changing. And, and so the question is, we are doing things on a scale, an enormous scale, a gigantic scale, thousands of tons, you count the zeros here, this is a logarithmic scale. So we are, in a sense, we are really plundering the planet. We are mining on a scale which is truly gigantic. And the question is, how long can we keep doing that? And what is going to happen as a result? Because these things that we mine, we use in the industrial system. They go through the industrial system and then go out to the industrial system. And where do they go? They are dispersed in the e ecosystem. Now, as long as it is sand, it's fine. But many of these metals are uh, Poison, poisonous, they're not good. Cadmium, lithium, not lithium, not, not a problem, but uh, uranium has its problems. And uh, mercury, for instance, mercury is a very poisonous substance. It, where does it go? Somewhere it has to go. Where is mercury? Most mercury, is, most mercury which has been mined is still in the industrial system. It goes somewhere, dispersed. It's not good for your health. 
and it goes to your brain, does some damage, and then you start um, telling people about limits to growth, probably. It has this effect on you. Anyway, let's see. I don't want to keep you for too long. So I, I would like to explain to you the physical basis of the model. So this is the most interesting part. If you are sleepy, it's a good moment to close your eyes <laughs> because I am going, I, I go very quickly through this just to give you some idea. But you see the people doing system dynamics, which is the basis of the, the, the study I was started with, they, they are trying very hard and very nicely to explain how system dynamics works using simple models which I call mind-sized models, models which can stay inside your mind. Because we need this kind of models, otherwise it's impossible to explain people who are not physicists or geologists or, or scientists. We need to convince people outside here, because here it's, I think it's rather easy to convince you. You look convinced, right? You're already convinced. It's easy. But try to do this outside a classroom in the universe. That's very difficult. So we have to be sure what we say and we have to find a way to explain it in such a way that it is understandable. But first of all for us, because we also have to be sure, we have to know what we're doing. We just can't just say there's a big model with many boxes and things. So stock and flow model means that this, the model is based on something like a stock of water. The stock of water is a thermodynamic potential. It flows because there is a gravitational potential. So you open your valve and the water flows away. And that's because there is a gravitational field, otherwise it would not. And anything that happens on this planet happens because there is a thermodynamic potential that makes it happen. As you already know, right? You are, you are a physicist, you, you ladies. No? You are logic students, you are, yeah, sort of, yeah, okay. Remember this, this point about thermodynamic potential. This is what makes everything move. And then we need to keep this into account because whatever we do, uh, we have this thermodynamic potential. And then we like to do these strange models which have to do with entropy. You know what is entropy, right? Now, you were waiting for that. I, I was waiting for, he will, he will tell us about entropy, right? You weren't curious about entropy. I will not explain you what it is. I, I suppose you already know. So anyway, I tend to, I tend to, uh, just to show you rapidly how this thing works. Uh, this is a simple system dynamics model, what you see on the, on the right, which is arranged in such a way to show that thermodynamic potential goes from high up to low, to below. You go from high potential to low potential. So something flows which doesn't need to be water, could be water, but it's like a fountain. Fountain where water goes from somewhere to something and then away. So the model is really very simple as you, if you understand this in this way. So this could be a very simple model that represents the sun, the earth, and space. Also, this is an interesting model because you need, very often you need to explain to people even the most simple things how it can be that CO2 hits the Earth. Because they, they will tell you, no, it is not possible if you have the sun. If it, the sun, some irradiation doesn't change, it is not possible. No, you can show you them with this model that Earth can heat up. If you open up this valve here, one way, but also if you, if you close this valve here, it's up because the heat remains inside the stock. And so it goes up. This is not a real, very, very, very complex world model, but it can, use, it can be useful because we need these kind of models if we have a, a, a vision of, of communication. We need to have ways of communicating these things even outside the laboratory of physics or logic or whatever. So this is a very simple model that can be used to explain people how system dynamics models work. And you can set it in different way, but just let me show you a slightly more complex model. But you see that the, system, the idea is always the same. Two stop models means you have a fountain with two levels, one and two. Potential, thermodynamic potential, 
larger, little smaller, little smaller, smaller. And then uh, this is a very simple model, yes, natural resources, industrial capital, but it is already a model which can describe things real. You can use this. I, 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 that's, that's to show you the curves that come up with this model. And you start recognizing something that I have been showing you before. You remember those curves by the, by the limits to growth. You had this thing going up, peaking, and going down. OK, this is the main reason why. If you set this in, in action, and uh, you assume that you make an even larger effort as, as you exhaust your resources, it becomes more and more difficult to extract resources. But at the same time, you're accumulating capital, which is used to extract those resources. So as it becomes more difficult, you consume more capital. Eventually, you reach a point in which you don't have any more capital to use to extract the resources. And so the curve goes up. And then it goes down. You have a peak. That's, by the way, is the basic concept of peak oil, which, which uh, let me not go into this, but uh, you know that in 1956, Mr. Hubbard made this proposal. He was another, another rather creative genius of geology. And they suppose that, oh, let's imagine that it goes like this. And, and he had no um, real, real way of, of proving this, but it was a model that turned out to be working. So, oil goes like this, and in many cases it does. And uh, myself, we were, we were with my co-worker, co I think we were the first to go to, with this model uh, to fit data quantitatively. So this is, for instance, for the gold rush. And we could fit. It works. Or for whaling in 19th century, which is a very interesting story. Uh, you, you remember Moby Dick? Yeah, that's it. Our uh, Moby Dick was written around here already on the downward side. You, you, you don't know, you never say in the book what the hell, we, we, why, why they were chasing whales so much. Or they, they, it, it is said in the book, it is for whale oil, but they never say in the book what whale oil was used for. Liquid fuel for lamps at that time. It was so obvious that whale oil was used for lamps that Melville didn't have to say it. Like we write a book about gasoline today, we don't need to say, we, don't, we think everybody knows what gasoline is. Maybe in 100 years from now, I think people say, well, what, what, what are they using gasoline for? Maybe they had to clean up the clothes, but what if they're dirty people using so much gasoline? That, ah, what, what were they doing? And, uh, and so you see, this is a very interesting story because the model is, uh, is not sophisticated, but it gives you it, an, an idea what What's happening? Capital is in terms of fleet, ships that you use to, to kill whales, and whales. And, uh, and you know, uh, waders at the time, they ran out of whales. Eventually, through this cycle, they, they found that they, 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 we don't have any more data here, but if you look at the literature, at some point they tell you that uh, in the whole ocean, there were left only 50 whales of this species, the species captured by this kind of ships. So, and, but uh, this is very difficult to explain to economists because they say there are economic reasons. Uh, any, anybody's an economist here? Raise your hand. You? No? OK. Ah, OK. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Fine, because this is the main danger for me, the economist in the audience. So I, keep, I keep this. <laughs> <coughs> so. It's an extremely interesting story, and we can fit also for oil. I mean, this is the work that I have been doing during the past few years, which is very fa fascinating and not easy because it's difficult to find the data, difficult to fit. But anyway, even such a simple model can describe some real world cases, so, which means we don't need such a large model as the one of the limits to growth. We can do it in some cases where the system is rather simple. Take one, res one resource, one industry, like whale oil and the whaling industry, crude oil and uh, the oil industry, then it works reasonably well. 
taking into account that um, real life is always more difficult than you think. So uh, if you look at the real data, the situation is more difficult than it seems. I, I used here the similarity with a reaction vessel. You have a reaction on the whole, your reaction goes in a certain direction, but there are points in the, in the vessel which, which go up and down in temperature. So you can see this, uh, only the only country which, which followed more or less Hubbard's law is the United States. Russia also did, but then it, it had a change, and Iran, Iran now is going down a lot. But this is also a long story that I will not go into. But as a first approximation, in order to have a mind size and model, the model that I've been showing to you is good. If you have some times, which you will later on, okay, you will study this, right? You're taking notes, and, and then you come to Italy, I, I'll question you about that, right? And, uh, but, uh, and we think, this is the story of peak oil. Peak oil, we think it will be uh, now, but again, uh, it, we're still in a stage when the, it is difficult to detect. As uh, right now, the production of oil is flat, which agrees with this model. And before we, we can really say this peak oil has come and we start the decline, then we need still a couple of years, two, three years. You still have a couple of years of gasoline for your cars. Maybe. Well, you know, models are, models are not to be used to predict the future, but to understand what the future could be. So this is a possibility. Don't take it as a prophecy, but a possibility. And uh, just let's see how long can I. You, you like this, yeah? You, you can stay another half an hour. You're happy. You see that you, this you smile. Somehow it means that. Uh, and just a quick, quick, more, um, another kind of model, three stock model. You know, I like fountains. We do like this bang, bang, bang. And this is an, uh, what I call the Seneca model. You know what Seneca? Seneca, the Roman philosopher. It's, uh, and this is also a word model, very simple, very, I'll explain you why, why I use the term Seneca. And uh, this is the model. It's a bit more complex, but you can still, it's made of blocks that you can understand. You can go with these blocks. And, and uh, the point is that uh, you don't have just resources economy, but also pollution. Pollution goes back to the economy and uh, it, it eats the economy because it damages the economy. And so what you have, you have a growth, but then some moment pollution kicks in and brings down everything. And you have this behavior here, you see, bang, you go shh, collapsing, which is very similar to what, to those curves that I was showing at the beginning. But now I think you have some idea, of course you follow with me, so intensely that you have absorbed everything I, I said and, and you understand exactly what I'm saying. And you have these curves are not just nicely well shaped. They go up and then whoosh, go down faster. And um, I call this the Seneca effect because Seneca said it would be a consolation. Things were to go bad as slowly as you take to build something. At, uh, and uh, instead, they, when, when things start going bad, it's an experience I'm sure you've made. When things start to go wrong, they go wrong very fast. It is also called the house of cards effect. It takes a lot of time to build a house of cards in the bank, and then it all goes down. So this, this is the way models can be used to, to, to adapt your head to these kind of things. And, uh, Starting from that, the idea of fountains, you can build more complex models, and then we go back. The, this is, don't, don't worry, don't worry, it's fine. It's just a model, it doesn't explode, it's, it's fine, it's, it's nice. It, it, it is the limits to growth model, more or less the same. Rebuilt, the same that I showed you before, all those little things that go up and down, up and, but this, there is a logic here, because you start with some potential, and you go down, you go down, you go down. You exploit 
the thermodynamic potential of the planet as you found it. Because these minerals have been built by accumulating potential for millions of years, like fertile soil, not millions, but hundreds of years, and then you exploit it. And then you dissipate this potential, creating entropy. You were, you were respecting for entropy, right? For entropy, and then you go down, go down, and then dissipate the potential to the universe. And this is the trajectory of the system, as long as these stocks here cannot be replenished. If it depends on the time scale. If you run this model on a time scale of uh, 100 million years, it's everything can be rebuilt. If you run it on a time scale of 100 years, then no, you go through one cycle. And you, with this model, you obtain again the same results as the that's the older model, which is an exercise that I made in order to see if I could rebuild the model in a way which was easier to understand. If you could follow the logic from the beginning, midway, then, and then arrive to this, and then you see it's the same, like you have pollution, you have population. Population, for instance, goes like this. This is time. Uh, time is just on one scale. It is not calibrated to anything, so there is you don't have to see it as a prediction, really. just to see that the population goes like this and then bang, goes down, or like this. You, you, can, you can enjoy playing with this model, if you like. It's very easy. You can, you can download the software from, for free from the Internet. And you can, once you had got and understand how to make such a model, it takes an afternoon. You don't have to be a specialist in anything, but of course, if you have to calibrate it on real data, it takes you a few years of work of, of a number of people. That's another story. But, and so it compares very well with the latest word calculation. Let's see, I'm going to finish this. Uh, that means other people are using other methods, but that's the main point I wanted to make for you. This, this, this is called cow. You know, you probably, have you seen a cow in your, your life? It's the, the thing that is related with milk. Now, milk is not a mineral resource, as you may know. Um, I'm, I'm told that the children now, they don't know where milk comes from. It's, it's, I think it's extracted from the ground, like oil. It's a, some wells give out black thing, which is oil, and water white, it's milk. So it's, uh, you know, you have fat cows and lean cows, and that, that's what all these calculations are telling us, that exploiting a non-renewable resource, exploiting essentially what you exploit is not a resource. You are exploiting, a, you are dissipating a thermodynamic potential. Dissipating a thermodynamic potential gives you this kind of curve, typically. And uh, it depends where you stand, you are happy or less happy, depends. Depends who you are, what you like, what kind of a world you're thinking of. So what is the future for it? It could be something like this. I don't know if it is. In a way, you know, you don't have to worry about traffic jams. It's although, if you start looking at these curves, you can see that some effects are less pleasant. So I, I, I spent some time studying the case of the big famine in Ireland, and that, that Something a bit scary because there is a big problem here, and up up to here, you know, people were very optimistic. Oh, there is plenty of food, cultivating potatoes, wonderful. Can keep going for hundreds of years, or maybe even worse. You know, the history of the Earth is full of mass extinctions. So a time zero, which is now, could have an even worse extinction. Could be which, uh, I don't know, it's, and uh, you may take two minutes to read this, if you like, because the whole thing has to do with Mother Gaia. Gaia is a paradigm of the ecosystem, so here we have uh, this thing, which I think is very nice, say, oh, Mother Gaia, we, we are sorry for the mess we have made, please forgive us. Oh, sorry, we, I'm, I'm your mother, forgive you, and don't worry, you will not be missed. And, and uh, so I, I don't really know. I think there are also positive things 
And uh, if you look, for instance, at this, and you look at photovoltaic power, you see that it's not based on non-renewable resources because it's based on sunlight. And the uh, curious thing that we, got, we have gone full cycle from the time of this flint because flint is the mineral that goes into silicon panels. You can make solar cells with silicon, which is abundant as a mineral, but it's probably the only mineral resource which can be cultivated. Because it, uh, any, any, any one of you studies uh, agriculture? You're not studying anything in this, in this university. <laughs> but uh, you know that uh, rice, rice husks, contain silicon. In rice, uh, the, many cereals have this crunchy, uh, leaves, they're crunchy because contain silicon. It, it is an evolutionary development to make life difficult for the animals who want to eat the food. But that contains silicon. The, the plants mine silicon for us from the ground. So it's another one of those things which is part of the cycle. So if we want to make um, solar cell, we will never run out of silicon for solar cells. So that it is possible to build up an economy which is not based on non-renewable resources and which is not just a subsistence agricultural economy. It's an economy which has, for instance, electricity. Could do it, we could do it, and Germany is one of the countries more advanced in the world in this, in this field. So, um, but it's not easy to explain to people that this, this is the way to go. It is the only possible way to go because the situation is such that we are seeing, you know, the Seneca cliff right in front of us. And the big problem is not a technological one. We don't set, solve this situation by miracle inventions. We solve it if we decide that there are reasons that have taken us where we are now, these reasons have to be understood, and we stop doing some of the things we're doing, like burning hydrocarbons, and thinking that burning hydrocarbons is a good thing. If we stop that, then there is no cliff, there is no disaster, there is no collapse of the ecosystem, but we need to go into something like this. And this is very difficult to explain, I found, but I think it's possible, it, we can do it. And so I invite you to think about that. It's unfortunate that we find ourselves, when explaining this kind of thing, we find ourselves in the position of Cassandra. And the job of Cassandra is not only thankless, because nobody believes you, also dangerous. So, I'm, but nevertheless, we have to say these things. And so I leave you to this. You see that there is a huge field with so many things that go together and, uh, and in this short time, I could not tell you everything I wanted to tell you, but I hope you liked it. And, and li later on, we get together and I explain you what is entropy, right? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Hugo, for this very inspiring lecture. And uh, as there is still enough time, if you have any questions, you're welcome to raise them. I'm sure you have questions. Get a microphone. You, you, you're asking, you asking yourself a question. I know that you are doing that. I, I, at this point of my career, I, I am telepathic. I understand what you're thinking. <laughs> not a, don't, don't worry, not everything, but uh, just, just about the lecture. Um, a little bit also, it's on all the matters, but not, no, don't worry, I won't tell anybody. Well, um, you spoke about, uh, a lot about um, the exploitation of minerals and the um, limits of growth um, um, in, um, related to the exploitation of these minerals, but um, isn't um, the book, The Limits of Growth, um, about uh, a whole rethinking of the economy? Because if we do plant 
things and do use solar energy, we still have this problem that we, um, we, our economy still is based on the th uh, thought of growing all the time. So if we use um, um, re renewable energy, we are going to need more space, more resources again. Um, so isn't it just um, a, new, a new thing of, of uh, going to, to, to a limit of, of growth? So, <laughs> so you think there is no solution to the problem, right? What no. is your solution? What's your idea? <laughs> Oh, you ask the question, you are responsible for what you ask, what do you have in mind? So yeah. you say that renewable cannot be, renewables cannot be used for growth, which I agree. Fine, we cannot grow over a certain limit. Yeah. And then? Yeah, sure, we, we, uh, I do agree that we, knew, uh, you know, that we need all um, renewable uh, energies we can get to save us from the collapse. But what's then? So um, we we stopped the collapse concerning the um, um, old the fossil energies, but then we have another problem. But because we haven't solved our uh, uh, basic problem of society, that we are still growing. You see, you had the answer yourself. That's a good good you you quote the idea. Okay, renewable energy can probably save us in part from collapse. But then where do we go? You can sketch it in your mind. You know where we are going. We are going to a society which is not growing because this thing goes to saturation. You, have a you said it. You, we have a limited space. At some point, we, when we start um, using all the area we have for growing, for, for solar panels, we have no space for, for, for cultivating the things we eat. So there is a limit. The limit is very clear in that case. And you go, but unlike the no renewable resource, remember, it will go, go like this, and then you fall to zero. Renewable, go like this, and if you are careful, they stay where they are, because you are not running out of resources. Then you have a good point, and the rest of the world, the rest of society, what can we do? I mean, like, like a computer, how can we make a, computer, a renewable computer? That's a very good point. Can we? For how long? Because, you know, this computer contains a good sample of all the elements of the periodic table. And most of them, not very few of them, we can grow from plants. Well, we can recycle, but not all. We can recycle. There is a, a, we can recycle in many ways, but the flow of this rare mineral, which will go into the society, into the economy, in the future will have necessarily to be much smaller than they are now. Not zero, be careful, not zero, but smaller. So it means you have to be much more careful of what you do. Computers will be expensive, this is a point I was discussing with Marcus today. Ubiquitous computers like now, like computer screens, like you, you all have this iPad things, right? And the screen is made, the touch screen of the i iPad is made with a rare element which is called indium. It's very limited and very difficult to recycle. Right now we don't recycle indium. So how are we going to survive without the iPad, right? And, and I think we'll have to learn that these kind of things will be expensive. But then it depends. I mean, there is one simple possibility we go back to the Middle Ages. Possible. Why not? Um, in, the, in, the, in that case, uh, I mean, there's no problem of resource depletion. Uh, by the way, our, if we go back to the Middle Ages, uh, you, you young guys will have to learn how to fight with uh, swords and armor. You ladies will learn uh, other things, but, uh, but you'll have plenty of resources for, for a smaller society because we have created so much metals like iron will be easy to find uh, everywhere. But that's another story. I mean, it... Thank you so very much for 
sort of making us think and think and not understand it, but I found it very, very thought-provoking, and I'm sorry that so few students have turned up to listen. And I wonder why, you know, are they really concerned about the future? I just have one thought. You were saying before that, oh, we know that at some stage, some scientists would have been able to tell me, most likely very clearly, that this planet is flat, that this, you know, and I would have believed it if I had lived at the time, and I thought, yeah, that I can see the ships disappear, and it's flat. And then later, somebody very convincingly told me it's not flat. I mean, I don't know that, only that people told me, because if you traveled around it, I haven't done this. And uh, I wonder if <laughs> we think that we reached peak knowledge, because, you know, you were just saying that not very long ago, people didn't know that we have a molten core and, you know, the heat and so on, just a very short time. Why should I believe that our knowledge is at a peak, and from now on it'll go down, and we won't find ways to cope. Why can't I believe that in a few hundred years, people will have come up with some completely different ideas to harvest, let's say, sun energy or whatever? Why, why would I think that now is what we know, and if we don't interfere, it can't get better, only oh, you, worse? You have a very, a number of very thought-provoking questions. <laughs> very good, yeah, it's very interesting. Okay, let, let me see. You mean that we reach peak knowledge? We could, we're not reaching, and you don't, you don't mean about economists, right? You don't, you're not speaking about economists, <laughs> because they reached the peak long ago, and now they're going down. Yeah, that's, uh, but depends on the relevance, because it's a point we, we dis were discussing with Marcus the whole afternoon. Knowledge, how we keep knowledge, how we maintain knowledge, and what the re relevance of knowledge on society, because mm -hmm. the, the story of the, of the hot core of the Earth, even if we were not knowing about it, it would still be there and, and creating all these um, cycles which keep the Earth alive. We know that, but the more we know, my impression is, is the more we are, we are aware of the limits. You see, uh, a few hundred years ago, people had no idea of the limits. Was no evident sign that people who wrote about about mineral minerals, the mineral in the industry, and like like uh, Georg Bauer in the 16th century was the first uh, modern uh, geologist. He wrote about minerals, a, a book which was titled in Latin "De Re Metallica" of things metallic, and, and but he had no idea of limits. Never written in the book that at some moment we run out. Of minerals. So the limits come more if you know more. The more you know, the more you realize your material limits, because then you have um, knowledge spaces which are enormous. You, you, you possibly, I think, I think we have limits in that area. We can keep learning new things. Uh, it's unbelievable the speed with which we are learning new things here. But I was mentioning the Higgs boson. But there are some revolutions happening all over, everywhere. They're like discovering extrasolar planets. I don't know, I, I was a fan of science fiction. Well, it's wonderful. Can you believe now that I would live to see the discover of extrasolar planets? It's, it's fantastic. If I think about that, I, I, I'm still bewildered. So you see, knowledge is not something that necessarily expands your material limits. It may very well reduce them. Because now that we know all those things about the mechanism, now we know why there are limits. And I think this is an answer to your question, but uh, it, it brings also more reasoning, more things that we should be considering. Well, um, knowledge is one thing, but um, the, the understanding or the common understanding of the knowledge is, in, is uh, another thing. So I think for most of the people, um, all this thinking about um, limits of growth, uh, about climate change, about the end of resources, 
um, is too far from their um, all day life to, to mention on, or to think about it really sincerely. So that um, they are just going to change something when the collapse comes. So, or maybe we are already collapsing, but aren't noticing yet. So, well, how do, do you have any vision um, how we, we may get this, this point <laughs> to, to common sense? We, we need to do that, otherwise we'll simply collapse. Or we may, we may collapse without knowing. You know, like, like you, you saw this, the, 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 the hurricane Sandy in New York. I mean, it, it's not caused but related to climate change. But the people in New York, the, at that point, you have the hurricane cam, coming over you. You don't have time to worry about climate change. Mm -hmm. You have to worry about surviving. It's like the drought in the Midwest. People don't have time. They have to survive somehow to, to keep going. And so there is, once, if we start collapsing badly. You know, we have the econo uh, economic crisis and everybody says, we don't have time to think exactly, about climate exactly. change you, you, because you, you, you we have, have to solve You have a way to asking questions having already the answer. I, yeah. I see. I, I, I told you that I am telepathic. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> and so it's uh, just adding something to your considerations. Like this is a big problem we have because we are not yet collapsing as a whole economy. Economy is still growing on the whole. So theoretically, we still have time to address the problems of climate change, resource depletion, ecosystem disruption, um, ocean acidification, overpopulation, a few little things that... that uh, and there is a window of opportunity. We can still do it. A few years, maybe one, ten years. And if we, if we decide to do something that we, will strongly soften the collapse, I don't think we can avoid to go down, but if we start now preparing, and you know, it is the old story of, of the Bible, you know, when, when uh, Joseph went to see the Pharaoh, said, we're going to, to have a big trouble, and the Pharaoh said, okay, let's get prepared. He could not avoid the seven years of lean cows, but he could get prepared. So uh, maybe we need a Pharaoh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I think it would be a little bit difficult, but you have some idea, explain how we would think that, we would see that. What political system, in your opinion, could, <laughs> could force us to get prepared for collapse? I don't know. Do you have an example for a process um, which turned around just before collapse? Um, I don't, we, we don't have such example. Then you, you, you're a guy who asks interesting questions. We, we, we have to think about that. We have examples of people, of societies, with braced against an external difficulties. So you brace against an, an enemy that you call war. You call it war preparation. You call it mobilizing. And that has been done, that period in history, periods in which people mobilize all together to fight, in most cases, other people, which, uh, which is uh, not, fortunately, not fashionable any longer in Europe, maybe, for, for now, because it is still very fashionable outside of here. So we have now to transform the same mechanism of mobilization in order to fight this challenge. I suppose if there is the classic theme of science fiction, we are invaded by aliens, then we mobilize against the aliens. Yeah. We, but the, uh, the aliens are obvious and this is good more point. complex and, well, uh, a war time situation normally ah, well, not just a democratic situation normally not. Yeah, yeah that's. Yeah. But you know, I think we will arrive to. to understand this point, because it starts being understandable. <laughs> yeah, no, really. I mean, you can start seeing Sandy, the hurricane, has been a big turning point. Because before Sandy, you could not, climate change was not an issue. Now it is. People are talking about this and in the news, in the media, and the internet. So it, it, there is a change. 
And at some point, I think it is possible that we have a, a perceptive turning point, like we had for terrorism in September 11, September 2001. It was a turning point. People first, terrorism, not such a big problem, then bang, everybody understands it. So we do need a catastrophe? No. The we don't need a catastrophe. Catastrophe is not enough. We need to exploit the catastrophe, or even, as, hopefully, not a very big catastrophe, but we need to use the knowledge we have to bring people over the tipping point, to understand that the problem of ecosystem is, prior, is the priority, not terrorism, not politics, not who wins the world championship, not gay marriage. Which, well, maybe it's, it's all important in its own way, but, but the real problem we have is the collapse of the ecosystem. And we need to have a turning point in the general perception of this. Otherwise, we're not going to do anything useful about that. You think it's difficult. I understand. I, I read your mind. Don't worry. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, it's, it's really just uh, more or less two comments. Um, I was wondering, the last question already focused on that. You, you made a very good point in uh, that there are two factors. The one is uh, narrating a story, uh, get, getting the message, message across, and, and the other would be um, uh, induce action. And uh, I, I think you tell a very good story with a positive outcome and you show, show possibilities for, for, for action. And, um, I was just wondering how you feel about um, two uh, concepts. One is, um, as a physical chemistry, you probably appreciate the work of Ilya Prigogine. Um, he wrote this wonderful book uh, together with Isabel Stengers, uh, and he focused on the con concept of emergence, that uh, current systems are so, so terribly um, um, complex that they, they work, uh, you, your, your models show this, uh, obviously, they work through uh, difficult uh, or uh, complex feedback strategies and that due, due to this due to this uh, 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 complex feedback interactions there are actually uh, uh, ways where where a, a systemic model can can completely alter itself through small changes um, so so my, my first question I guess is um, how do you feel about uh, emergence and uh, system theory and the second focuses on um, uh, the, the Documenta 13, uh, Bruno Latour, uh, a couple of years ago, has um, uh, developed this, this concept. He calls it the Parliament of Things. So um, uh, you, you have to, uh, what, what you have to do in order to tell a good story is to, to have local voices. And local voices are not just reduced to, to uh, human voices, but, but can also contain uh, the voices of cows and trees. And the Documenta 13, um, at least in some aspects of it, Made, made, made a certain point where, uh, where we, we should try to, to use uh, cultural artifacts um, as, uh, as uh, means to convey the voices of, say, cows and trees. I was just wondering how you feel about these two, two, two ideas. So yes, good, good point you have. And these models are not showing emergence in the sense that Prigogine was, uh, was mentioning um, already a few years ago. Emergence means somehow the system uh, complexifies by itself. So in this case, as you see, it is static. It doesn't change. You start with a number of, of stocks and flows, and the system runs until it runs out of resources. So it's a limit of this model, absolutely. The point is, however, what is very clear from these studies is that you have this emergency. If you have a strong fluxes, flows of energy, so this system, it's uh, it's an approximation of reality which will be the more uh, accurate as we run out of energy, as we run out of resources. The system will not have the resources, the, the flow, to to bifurcate and to and to become more complex. But you, you suggest you, Prigogine is nice. Read the works of Arto Anila. You ever heard of him? Is a, uh, this is very, very nice. It's a physicist in Copenhagen. It's wonderful work. 
very difficult, honestly. But he has a model which does exactly what, what you said. It bifurcates, creates more complexity, but very clear that you need a lot of flow in order to have this, this kind of, uh, of complexification. So it's very nice, but it's not a criticism for the, this model. The model tells you that you have finite resources. You eventually you go down, and these stocks disappear because they are thermodynamic potential which are dissipated to space. About the other question, it's uh, it's also very interesting. I think we have to use all the weapons in tenders as media we have to bring this tipping point in cultural perception of the problem. So. Um, Everything you have, gentlemen and ladies, I suggest that you use because it's really an emergency situation. We don't have that many years before we start really going down fast. And we need to fight now as we still have a chance to do that. So for now. Questions have been exhausted. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, I, I thank you very much. And sorry for having read your mind a little bit, but it's it's okay. I, w I won't tell anybody. <laughs> cool. Thank you very much for this very inspiring lecture. And um, if there are no more questions, I actually think we should call it a close.